Hey there, Broadmoor family, friends, guests. However you arrived at our YouTube channel, whether by intention or by accident, we're just really glad you're here and hope and pray that you will be blessed. Even during our pandemic times and our ability to meet has changed, we're just glad that we can still offer this opportunity. It reminds us we're not alone, that we are family, and that we can meet in a variety of different ways. Speaking of family, I'm wondering if you could do me a favor this week, perhaps this day. It's not a very difficult favor, but if you just pay close attention, I've got a, a challenge to issue to you. It's not a, an unfamiliar challenge. I've issued it before, but I'm going to issue it again. I want you just to stop what you're doing right now. So if you've got your phone as you're listening or you're watching, just put it down for a minute. Put the cup of coffee down, the cup of tea. If you're eating breakfast while you're taking this in, just put that aside for a moment. You can get back to that to your heart's content in a few moments time. But right now, just focus in and listen. I want you to think for just a moment of the family of God here at Broadmoor. If you're visiting with us and you're from another church or you don't attend church anywhere, think of your neighborhood, where you live, your family members, okay? Think for a moment. What name came to your mind? Whatever that is, whoever that is, I want you to check in with that person today or at least in the next couple of days. Just check in with them. Make sure they're okay. Um, say hello in, in a culturally and uh, age-appropriate way. I mean, if you're, if you're a texter, then text one another. If you want to email, if you want to call, if you just want to say, sup, whatever, I don't care. Check in with someone. Make sure they're doing okay because that's also what it means to be family. When we can't meet together personally, we still need to know that we're connected in some way. So whatever name came to your mind as you, you went through that brief exercise, check in on that person. Now, don't be upset if no one checks in with you. It's not, it's not about that. It's about responding to the opportunity that you've just been given by God's grace to think of others in your family. And the reason I want you to do this is because I believe it is an act of worship. If you remember many months ago and perhaps years ago, I said that sort of a poor man's definition of worship is telling God what we think he's worth. So checking in on someone is telling God what we think he's worth because we think he's worthy enough to make sure that we're looking out for our neighbors, looking out for our family members, looking out for our friends. So check in on them today. It's an act of worship. After all, you and I were made to worship. We're forgiven and free. We are loved by the Father and indeed given great abundant opportunity to show that love to others. So let's continue and begin our worship service really by singing that very song, Made to Worship. Let's sing.
Our call to worship today comes from pastor and author Tim Challies. It's not a responsive call to worship, but it is a, a call to worship that shows some contrast, contrast between who I am and who God is. So as I read these words, and you can imagine them for your own life, because they are a reminder of how deeply we have been loved by God and that indeed God is worthy of our praise. The call to worship is called, is titled, I am, you are. I am guilty of many sins, but you, O oh Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. I am forever looking for joy in all the wrong places. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is the fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. I am plagued by many troubles and many trials, but you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I am prone to getting myself stuck in dead ends and broken situations, but you are the God who works wonders. You are great and do wondrous things. You, O oh Lord, are my hope. I am alone in this world, but you are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. You are my help and my deliverer. I am quick to lose hope and give up, but you, O oh Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. You are good and do good. You are righteous, O oh Lord. You are my God. Therefore, O oh God, my God, I seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Teach me to do your will. For you are my God. Let us continue to worship in song.
sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, The scripture reading today is from Acts chapter 4, verse 36, to Acts chapter 5, verse 11. And we are reading from the New International Version. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. 
Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And a great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said. That is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At the moment she died at his feet. Then the young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. I read an article the other day that had a phrase in it that, as I read it, had a bit of an ominous tone to it. I've borrowed that phrase, actually, as the sermon title for today's message. And the phrase was this. It said, we see you, pastors. Now, the author of the article intended it to be an encouragement to pastors that we see. We see you struggling through these difficult days. We see you struggling to learn new technology and new ways of communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to a world in, amidst a pandemic. We see you struggling with all those kinds of things. We see you wrestling, trying to hold all things in tension. We see you smaller church pastors that are uh, doing their best to record sermons or go live with live stream where the mega churches have these great church budgets and, and tech equipment and all kinds of people that, that pull it off in an instant. And, and there's a comparison, and it can be depressing, it can, it can be frustrating, and it can be difficult for us all. And we see you, pastors. On the one hand, it's a phrase that's kind of daunting. Eyes on you. We see you. Because the phrase also carries with it that punch that we see you in the times that you aren't in the office, that you aren't doing well, that you're maybe struggling just coping with the day. We see you, pastors. But eyes on can also be a really good thing. It can be an encouraging thing, especially in terms of setting an example of Christ-like behavior that people want to see and follow and imitate. When you're modeling that amidst the difficult times, eyes on is a good thing. It's a good thing because sometimes when we see the things we want to see and we recognize that those are the characteristics of Jesus we want to emulate in our lives and we follow it, then eyes on is a good thing. Eyes on us as Christians just in the sense of having a calm, Christ-like, compassionate demeanor amidst the ever-increasing conspiracy theories or uh, pandemic restrictions is also uh, daunting, but a good thing as the community around us, as our city, as our world sees that we are indeed 
a loving, incredible, caring, compassionate presence of Christ in the midst of the storm. Eyes on can be a good thing. And eyes on can be both a daunting thing and a good thing, uh, an ominous thing and an encouragement when we think about the fact that God obviously sees all and he knows all. Our hope and prayer is always when God sees us serve and love and bless that it will be met one day with those words, well done, good and faithful servants. The article I read went on to say, knowing that God and his people are watching, whether to imitate or to judge, helps us pay attention to how faithfully we live. Others see how we live and act. God sees. Let's be honest with each other. And let me ask you to think about your life this past week. Think about what took place. Think about how you lived and acted during this past week. Just think this past week, not this past month or year or whatever. Just this past week. Even perhaps the past 48 hours. Now, think about that same time frame, how you lived and acted this week, the things you did, the things you said, the things you thought. With this phrase in mind, we see you brothers and sisters. The community sees you. Your family sees you. God sees you. Let me ask, what do we see? I don't intend this phrase or this sermon to be judgmental or frightening in its tone, but it may, it may, if nothing else, be self-revealing and make us squirm just a little and that's okay. It's okay to squirm sometimes. We need to squirm every now and then, lest we become completely complacent and content. And to me, that question, what do we see, ties right in with the passage that we had read for us in Acts 4 and 5. The story of three people. On the one hand, we have Joseph, a Levite, more commonly known as Barnabas. Now, I'll refer to him as Barnabas for the rest of the sermon. And we also have a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. For many, it's a familiar story. Although most of the time, truthfully, we probably don't see the two pieces put together as one message. Um, usually this, these couple of verses at the end of chapter 4, verses 36 and 7, 37 about Barnabas, we usually attach it to the preceding verses where it talks, you know, usually it's a sermon about how the church had everything in common and there's this guy Barnabas who was part of that. And he sold a field, brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. Awesome. Everything in common. And then we turn to the page to chapter 5 and we tell a separate story. A difficult story. The story of Ananias and Sapphira. Like the phrase, we see you, that has an ominous tone. The story kind of carries the same ominous tone. And perhaps from it, uh, and from the scripture reading as you heard it, you might be thinking, oh boy, the pastor's going to have one of those finger-wagging, guilt-tripping, good old-fashioned judgment kind of message. Because that's probably how the story's been represented to you in the past. If it hasn't, that's great. But that's not the intent of the passage. If that's where we went with it, we'd actually miss the bigger story of what's going on here. I mean, truthfully, can I, if I, let me be very honest with you and blunt with you. I would rather skip chapter 5, verses 1 to 11 in the scriptures. I'd rather move from chapter 4, verse 37, right down to chapter 5, verse 12, because verses 1 to 11 carry that ominous, not very nice, certainly not pastoral, and definitely not grace-filled at its face value kind of message I look for and hope for in the scriptures. Especially when you read in chapter 4, verse 33, where it says, just prior to our passage, much grace was upon them all, or God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. You read that, and the little bit about Barnabas, and then you read verses 1 to 11, and it just doesn't seem to fit the context, the narrative. So I'll admit, I'd rather skip down. 
And I'm not alone. I've read some theologians who have gone on the record saying that they actually kind of hope this story in Acts chapter 5 is just the stuff of legends and not true because it makes the apostle Peter uh, seem harsh. It makes God's judgment seem so exceedingly severe. No second chances are given here. No courteous visit to the widow to let her know what happened to her husband before she makes the same mistake. Just more apparent harshness. I'd rather skip it. But I can't. We can't. There's no faking it here. There's no skipping through the tough stuff. The truth is, is often raw and and real and sometimes it's just not to our liking but it is truth nonetheless and that truth in this passage that we had read for us is clearly portrayed in a vivid contrast and I think that's where the lesson lies in understanding this story is in the contrast of these two parties you've got Barnabas and you've got Ananias and Sapphira. Their stories need to be looked together because they're linked together. They're linked together by grammar, by sheer grammar. Yes, the interpreters of the scriptures uh, put a chapter division between the two stories, but grammatically speaking, there is a connection. The NIV chooses to use the word now at the beginning of verse one in chapter five, as if to say, eh, we're moving on, and here's a new story. Now, now this is what happened. But the, the word that's there in verse 1 is actually the word but. It could also be translated and or moreover. It's a conjunction. It connects. That's what conjunctions do. You remember the little schoolhouse rock date? I know I'm aging myself. You know, conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up words and phrases and clauses. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a conjunction. It connects. The stories are connected. We can't separate them. We have to deal with them together. The story of Ananias and Sapphira is connected by that one little word to this brief comment about Barnabas. You can't look at the story of one without looking at the story of the other. So what does it say? What can we learn about this uh, and the contrast between Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira? First, let me briefly tell you what the story is not about. Underscore, not. Let me say what it is not about. Because, and I'd love to flesh this out more, but for the sake of time, uh, we, just, we just don't have it. But take note of this. Because it's really important, foundationally, before we understand what, what it is about, I need to dispel some of the, the thoughts that you might have about, about this passage and tell you what I believe it's not about. First of all, this is not a story about stewardship, giving, the practice of tithing. Yes, a key component in this story is giving and the contrast between the two parties. They both sold fields and gave proceeds to the, this, this early church, the people of the way. But the story is not then about this is about giving your all. You make sure you bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. No, that is not what it is. This is not a story that says Barnabas was better because he gave his all. Therefore, you should give your all. It's not. In fact, Barnabas didn't give his all. Can I make that very clear to you? He didn't give his all. It said he sold a piece of property and gave the money to the people of the way to help them in the early church help others. The implication there is that there's more where this came from. So he didn't give us all. He gave the proceeds of that particular field to the church, to the people of God. Okay, So it's not a story about stewardship. So don't, don't look at this and say, oh, I think God is telling me about stewardship. Put that out of your mind. Neither is it a story about judgment. Yes, judgment is passed on Ananias and Sapphira. It is harsh and it is immediate. And it has a powerful impact on the community because it says twice, verse 5 and verse 11, great fear seized all who heard what had happened. 
but it's not the main thrust of the story either. This isn't an opportunity to say, this is about judgment, so you better get your stuff together because this is a turn or burn kind of moment. It's not a story about that. God's judgment here is unique to show what I believe is the real point of the story. More on that shortly, but for now, it's not a story about stewardship. It's not a story about judgment. And it's not even a story about hypocrisy. It's often what people think about, right? I mean, the, the criticism I've heard lots and lots of times from others is, oh, all you Christians are hypocrites. You, you live one way on Sunday and you live a different way Monday through Saturday. And, and truthfully, that's probably true some of the times and with some people. Some people are hypocrites. Um, hypocrisy, remember, is being an actor. It's pretending. Uh, you're a stage player. That's, that's the, the origin of the word. So in one sense, Ananias and Sapphira do a hypocritical thing because they pretend one thing is true and then present uh, without presenting the reality of what is actually true. But what's happening here is much deeper than just mere hypocrisy. So what is going on? What can we learn from this? What does this contrast between Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira actually teach us? Three things, briefly, that I want to share with you. Three things that I believe this story does teach. The first is this. It is a story about deceit and its consequences. It's a story about deceit and its consequences. Why were Ananias and Sapphira punished? As I said, it's not about mere hypocrisy. It isn't even about withholding the tithe. They aren't punished because they didn't give all the proceeds. <laughs> the crime they actually committed in the eyes of God is, is not the same as, you know, sometimes we'll, let, let's be honest here, like sometimes we make commitments, or the desires of our heart is to make a commitment to God, and sometimes it comes to tithing or serving, like, Lord, I, I want to tithe this much to you, and then circumstances come along, we don't, we don't meet up with that commitment. This is not a story about, oh, you're going to be in a severe deceit if you don't live up to that commitment. No, that's not the case here. We all, I mean, if it was, we'd all be in a load of trouble because we've all probably been there where we've made a commitment of some kind to God and just kind of fell short. Not that our hearts didn't want to get there. We just didn't get there for whatever reason. Anyway, the crime, the sin, is lying to God. The crime is lying to God. It's not that they promised God something and failed to live up to it. Rather, they were intentionally deceitful to God. For me, that's deeper than mere hypocrisy. And it's deeper than a failed promise. Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira lied, as Peter puts it, to the Holy Spirit while attempting to make themselves look better than they were in the eyes of others. We see you. What do we see? In this case, we saw, we see the contrast. Barnabas gives, just out of the generosity of his heart, Ananias and Sapphira lying to God in an attempt to make themselves look better. John Stott points out this. He says, they're not so much misers as they were thieves. They wanted the credit and the prestige for sacrificial generosity without the inconvenience of it. <laughs> they, let me repeat that. They wanted the credit and prestige for sacrificial generosity without the inconvenience of it. So, in order to gain a reputation to which they had no right, they told a brazen lie. Their motive in giving was not actually to relieve the poor, to help the poor, but to fatten their own ego. Whereas Barnabas, as I said, is a story about someone that is genuinely charitable due to a transformation of the heart. He gave 
because he could. He gave because he could. Ananias and Sapphira stand for the exact opposite. Their actions were not done to the glory of God, but for the glory of themselves. They weren't merely pretending like a hypocrite, like an actor. They were intentionally deceitful, and they suffered the consequences. We may not like the idea. Uh, I mean, we may want to skip right over it, like I said earlier, but we can't. There is, this is clear. There is no deceiving God. He is not mocked. And he will indeed judge the heart, not on a sliding scale about how much you give, but about how you live. Not on a, a sliding scale in terms of how many mistakes you've made or if you haven't fulfilled your promises, but if our hearts are intentionally deceitful toward him, that will be judged accordingly. Now, I have a feeling as you're, as you're listening to this, it's probably not you. I pray and I hope it's not you. But it's a lesson that we must learn because there come times when we are tempted to bring glory to ourselves, to elevate ourselves to a place of, oh, look how, how, how wonderful I am in, in helping the poor and helping the church. There's a temptation in that. And if you don't think there's a temptation in that, um, and maybe there's not for you, but I know for a lot of people, the pat on the back is a huge temptation. The self-glorification is a huge temptation. So we need to, to hear this warning about this danger. It's about deceitful, deceitfulness, about lying to God. You know what? It's also a story, and this is more positive, it's also a story about freedom. You probably don't catch that because you're, you're too busy, well, like me at first, as I look at it and thinking, whoa, this is incredible. I can't believe it. they just dropped dead on the spot. This is, this is severe. This is harsh. But it's also a story about freedom. The new covenant is all about freedom, the freedom that we have in Christ. We are free from the bondage of sin through Christ's sacrifice. We are free from religiosity. We are free to serve and worship in spirit and in truth. We are free because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom to be who God wants us to be. Freedom to serve how he wants us to serve and give as he leads us to give. There is freedom that is now the believer's promise. And it's a very different thing compared to the ways that um, Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira would have been used to under the Old Covenant. Ways in which they had been trained and reared and immersed in that they are now being transitioned from in their lives. When we come to faith in Christ, we're transformed. Our hearts are transformed. Our very way of doing and being is transformed. Peter tries to get at this in the conversation that he has with Ananias at first. Verses 33 and 4 of chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. It's almost like he says to Ananias, you know, there aren't actually any rules or regulations requiring you to sell your property and give it all to the poor, give the proceeds. It's your land. You can do with it what you want to do with it. You have the freedom. No one forced you to sell the property. If your heart doesn't tell you to do so, then don't do it. So here is part of the contrast that, that, that we get, need to get a hold of. Barnabas is an example of someone that is free in Christ, and he acts accordingly. He gives out of who he is. Ananias and Sapphira are not. Their deceit shows that they truly aren't free, but they're still in bondage to sin. But this is a story about freedom. Ananias and Sapphira, they had the freedom to, to not do what, not to not sell the property, but they, they intended to lie to God and make themselves look better in the eyes of others. God is not mocked. But God does want to give you that freedom. That's why he sent his son to free us from sin. It's also a story about mercy and grace. It's a story about mercy and grace. As I alluded to earlier, um, 
the story seems to be void of any form of grace. It, that it doesn't, that it seems to be missing that much grace was upon them all kind of feeling to it or application. And yet the more we dig into this passage, the more we see that it really is about mercy and the grace of God powerfully at work in them all. Let me review just that brief sort of layman's definition that I love to give about the grace and mercy. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do. Grace is, not, grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Kind of like two sides of the same coin, but they apply in different ways. As we look at this story, we need to ask, we put ourselves in Ananias and Sapphira's shoes for just a moment. Aren't we just as guilty of sin as Ananias and Sapphira? And if so, why aren't we punished with the same immediate harsh death sentence? I'll tell you why. It's because of the grace of God and his mercy. While this event serves as a warning, kind of like um, the old concept of firing a warning shot across the bow of a ship is a, considered to be a warning, it's not intended to suggest that, this story is not intended to suggest that all who sin will be immediately struck dead. If that were the case, there would be no one on earth. That's the truth. Without mercy and grace, we deserve judgment and its ultimate penalty. But God, in his mercy, rich in mercy, the scriptures tell us, he withholds judgment. Remember what it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, Dear friends, God is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's mercy. He's not, he's, he's not slow in keeping his promises. He, he wants, he's giving us opportunity to respond. That's mercy. And in his grace, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, making it possible for us to be forgiven and restored to a right relationship with him. He gives us opportunity to respond to the leading of, those, of his Holy Spirit so that we might indeed be set free. Wow. We see you, brothers and sisters. We see you, image bearers of God. Our neighbors see you. They, our neighbors see us. Our family sees us. Our co-workers see us. God sees us. What do they see? Do they see people living in the freedom that we have in Jesus? I was participating in a webinar this week which reminded me uh, of this truth. And we're working our way to a close here. And it was, stated, it was something that was stated in a really provocative way. A way that's not normally heard from pastors, a, a statement that's not normally heard from pastors because we are so often focused on, I got to bring an application. I got to tell these pe the people I'm preaching to, here's what you got to do, 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 do. Instead of that gentle reminder that it's about who we are. It's not about do, it's about be. It's not about doing, it's about being. The statement that the presenter in the workshop was giving, uh, he, he borrowed from Tim Keller, uh, and it reminds us that, and here's the statement that I, I say is kind of provocative. If we do nothing as people of God for the rest of our lives, God still loves us. You see, we don't do anything to be Christians. We are just simply his image bearers. We are his family, whether we do anything or not. The scandal of the gospel is that God loves us anyway, regardless of what we do or don't do for the rest of our lives. That's the scandal of the gospel. So we need to rethink and how we view life as Christians because our doing happens, but it comes out of our being. Barnabas was a man who was free in Christ and acted accordingly. 
and much grace was upon him. His doing came from his being. Think of it this way, and this is the, the illustration came in this same webinar, so it's not original with me. So, birds don't fly because they're supposed to fly. They fly because they get to. Birds don't fly because they're supposed to fly. They fly because they get to. We serve Jesus and others not because we're supposed to, but because we get to. How freeing is that? We serve, we love, we give, we bless because we get to, not because we have to, not because we must. And this contrast here at the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5 tells this story of freedom in this unique, incredible way. It's not about judgment, hypocrisy, or even stewardship. It's about relationship. You and I are people given the opportunity to receive forgiveness and be restored to a right relationship and act accordingly, and much grace will be upon us. Ananias and Sapphira were not. Their actions were, was, contained evidence that they had not truly been set free. They wanted the external approval. What's your motivation? What do people see? Not perfection, I can tell you that for sure. But hopefully, they see people living free in Christ, who serve because they get to. So fly, my friends, not because you must, but because you get to. As we move forward in this new year toward a new way, that's what people need to see. Amen. And now hear these words as our words of benediction today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go in his grace. Amen. Amen.